Great. So just to introduce everyone, my name is Tessa, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. We have Louisa, who you just saw, and she's going to be helping us with our interactivity and our tech support today. So if you have any questions um, and are worried about how to navigate Zoom or the other features we're using today, you can go ahead and ask her on chat. And as well, we have Joe there, who's our presenter for the day. Awesome. So also, before we get into uh, this session, I'll like to introduce the remainder of what we have for the summer webinar series. We have two more sessions that are upcoming on August 5th, Understanding Climate Change Lessons from Deep Time, and August 19th, Shipping Noise and Reductions During COVID-19. So we hope to see you for those sessions if um, you're interested. And uh, we'd also like to explain our interactivity for today. We're going to be using something called Mentimeter. And if you haven't joined one of our previous sessions, this might be something that's new to you. But um, basically, it's a way for us to engage you as audience members and hear your voice during this presentation. Um, so if you'd like to participate, it's completely optional and completely anonymous. All you have to do is go to menti.com on another browser tab or on a mobile device and enter the code 508272. And just to test out that this is working, we're going to try a Mentimeter question right now, which is a very easy one. So Louise is going to switch over to our Mentimeter screen. Oh, lovely. It looks like some people have figured out how to use this already. We have people from Victoria, as expected, all the way from Ottawa, from Seattle. <laughs> How many different ways can you spell Victoria? Souk, that's great. So it looks like 14 of you have managed to figure this out so far. If you have any questions, just feel free to put them in the chat and we'll be able to help you. From Saanich, another from Seattle. From Bellevue, Vancouver, from India, Outer Banks in the chat, from your home. <laughs> I'll just give this one more minute so people can figure out how to do this. From the Philippines, wonderful, wow. From Halifax. Great. We'll have a couple more Mentimeter questions throughout this presentation, so there will be more chances for you to participate. And I'm going to, um, we're going to stop sharing now and swap over to Joe. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Joe, our presenter for today. It's my great pleasure to introduce him. He is a senior staff scientist at Ocean Networks Canada and joined the Science Services Division of Ocean Networks Canada in January 2020. He was trained as an oceanographer at the University of British Columbia and completed the PhD program in 2003. He has since worked in research and academia with a focus on nutrient biogeochemical cycles, water quality, and ecosystem health of coastal and ocean systems. At Ocean Networks Canada, Joe provides science support for the many sensors, platforms, and projects that operate under the themes of biological and chemical oceanography. It's wonderful to have Joe here today. Thanks, Tessa. Can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Perfect. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm uh, great to see everybody joining this morning, and I'm um, looking forward to telling you about Argo Floats and our plans at Ocean Networks Canada. I'm going to start my screen share now. So as Tessa mentioned, I'm a trained oceanographer from the University of British Columbia. I wanted to just provide a little bit of information about me, but before I do, I would like to, on behalf of the University of Victoria and Ocean Networks Canada, thank our host nations. We acknowledge and respect the Songhees, the Esquimalt, and the Wasanich peoples on whose traditional territories the university stands and whose historical relationships to the land continue to this day important part of the university and an important part of Vancouver Island. Before I start my talk today, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about me, where I come from. Um, I grew up in British Columbia in the interior, not near the ocean, but 
I had some experiences in my youth, including a very formative experience sailing with my family. This is my uncle uh, on his sailboat. We sailed from Hawaii to Victoria when I was a teenager. And uh, certainly one of the reasons why I went into oceanography and from UBC, I got my PhD in botany with my supervisor, Dr. Paul J. Harrison, who's now deceased. And from there, I went to the United States and I did a postdoc at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. So that was a fellowship opportunity. I spent um, almost four years there before I moved to a faculty position in Oregon. And during those during my time in Oregon, I was fortunate to do all sorts of uh, exciting adventures, including going to Antarctica. This picture in the middle is me on a trip to Antarctica with the Students on Ice organization. I went as an as a, um, oceanographic instructor for high school and college students from Canada and around the world. And now I'm um, showing a picture with me and my two children. Uh, like most of you, we're not having a very exciting summer. We're spending a lot of time social distancing. Um, picking berries is one good way to do that. I wanted to, I know this seems like a daunting slide to start with, but this is a slide from our last web webinar two weeks ago, where Dwight Owens talked about some of the major changes in the oceans caused by humans that uh, we can detect and that we know are occurring. Uh, for example, ocean warming, ocean acidification, and ocean deoxygenation. Those were the topics from that webinar two weeks ago. And this figure was show, shows the uh, model predictions for 50, 40 to 50 years in the future where oceans are expected to be quite a bit warmer and quite a bit less salty in the Northeast Pacific. And these are, Dwight went through some of the reasons why this is a cause for concern. What I'm gonna talk about today is how do we know so much about the oceans? And so you see a picture like this, where does the data come from? We know that you can see changes in temperature of the oceans from satellite remote sensing, but that only shows you the surface. What do, how, do, how have we gone from not knowing um, much about the ocean's abyss to enough that we can make accurate predictions of how things will change in the future? So I'm going to give you a quick overview here. I'm going to introduce you to the Argo program. This is the program that um, is one of the ways that we know how now what the deep ocean conditions are. Um, from there, I'll talk about marine biogeochemistry, and then the two go together for, we, I'm going to discuss biogeochemical Argo floats. That is marine platforms that are, we'll be calling floats that move through the ocean measuring biogeochemical parameters. So traditionally, oceanographers studied the ocean from ships. That seems pretty obvious. This is the John P. Tully, one of the Canadian Coast Guard ships on the West Coast that also functions as a scientific research vessel. From a ship, oceanographers lower a CTD rosette that's shown here. What you can see in the picture are bottles with their tops and bottoms open, as well as an instrument platform called a CTD. It stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth. So it measures the salinity and the temperature of the water. And when this instrument is lowered in the ocean, it takes a water column profile of those ocean properties. And at times when you want to retrieve water from any depth that this instrument is at, you can trigger those bottles, bring it back to the surface, and sample the water. So that's the classic way to sample the ocean. Here's a more of a close-up of the instrument package for you to see when it's on board the ship. So for the history of oceanography, going on a ship and doing CTD casts was one of the primary ways to learn about the ocean. And in the 1990s, this experiment called the World Ocean Circulation Experiment was conducted 
This was a 10 year program with over 30 countries participating to try to sample all the areas of the ocean in an effort to better understand chemical physical properties of the ocean. So these red lines represent ship tracks where a ship would travel from one side of the ocean to the other or from north to south making these CTD casts every so often and recording the data. This is a phenomenal effort. It was 15 years in the making, starting in the 1970s with planning and trying to understand how to coordinate such a thing and then carrying it out with some of these um, transects taking likely three to four months to complete. And, and all told, this likely also cost them approximately a billion dollars to complete this experiment, which provided the detailed information from many of the world's oceans. But one of the things that was recognized by the people that were participating in the WOS experiment was that most of these places were only visited once. So even though there's a wide, um, there's a broad area that was sampled, many of those spots were only sampled once. So think of if we didn't have temperature and meteorological equipment on land and the only way to know what the temperature was was to go somewhere and measure it. So you drive from Vancouver to Halifax and you take temperature measurements every so often when you stop at a city. Well, when you're finished the, and when you're in Halifax and someone asks you, well, what's the temperature in Regina, Saskatchewan, you would tell them what you measured and we all know that it would have changed since then. And that's no different in the oceans. And so while we did get a clear picture of the trends and the patterns in, in parameters, we don't know much about how the ocean changes because we don't go back and sample again. It's far too expensive and too much work. So modern platforms have evolved to fill this need. Lots of autonomous instruments and advanced sensors have led to a much better understanding of the oceans. Satellites, not only do they help with communication, but they can remotely sense the surface of the ocean, as can aircraft that are uh, flying over the ocean surface. Ships themselves are very advanced now and are able to um, use various instruments to look down to the depths of the ocean. And then there's a variety of autonomous platforms. And those of you familiar with Ocean Networks Canada will know about the cabled observatory and the platforms that are attached as well as moorings and free drifting floats in the surface ocean. More recently, autonomous underwater vehicles have become more popular and these operate on their own and can sample in all sorts of fashion and um, at various depths in the ocean. And then finally, what we're gonna talk about today is something that's typically called a profiling float or an Argo float. And this is a float that I'll describe its operation. So just to remind you of the Ocean Networks Canada infrastructure, we have cabled observatories that extend into the North Pacific Ocean as deep as the Endeavour Ridge at 2,300 meters. What you may not know is that Ocean Networks Canada also operates a variety of other types of platforms such as instruments on the BC ferries and moorings. And what we uh, are excited to move into is some more water column measurements, including Argo floats, and the reason why I'm telling you about it today. So. All right, so we have another Mentimeter question for you. Um, this is a fun one. <laughs> Just try and guess what does the word Argo mean? Um, and Louise is gonna start sharing. Great, you have, we have eight participants so far on this slide. <laughs> Got some tough answer cho answer choices here. All right, I'll just give it a couple more seconds here. And looks like the majority got it right. So yes, Argo was a ship on which Jason and the Argonauts sailed from Locos, 
to Colchis to receive, retrieve the golden fleece. But I think some of these other answer choices are correct in um, they use Argo in different contexts. But for the Argo program, this is where it drew it, the inspiration for its name. So we're going to switch back over to Joe now. OK, I would like now to um, play a short introductory video for you about the Argo program. This video is widely available, and um, it's from early in the Argo program. And so it um, represents sort of the, the ideas during the onset of this program in the late 1990s. Scientists on research ships can sample the ocean only briefly, so they deploy automated devices for long-term ocean monitoring. This float is part of an international research program called Argo. It measures ocean conditions that drive events such as El Nino's and climate change. Like a hot air balloon, it drifts along on slow-moving currents in the deep sea. The float dives by mechanically decreasing its volume in the water, and it descends to as far as two kilometers, more than a mile, to survey otherwise unmeasured underwater regions. Submerged for up to 10 days, the float can be programmed to stay at one depth or to move up and down to follow changing conditions. At preset intervals, it ascends by increasing its volume. Rising through many ocean layers, it records the ocean pressure, temperature, and salinity, collecting an up-to-date profile of evolving ocean conditions. At the surface, the float makes radio contact. Its new location reveals the features of underwater currents, and the data supply real-time measurements of subsurface ocean conditions, details unavailable without Argo. After a short period, the float is ready for another cycle, a process it can repeat for more than five years. With 3,000 floats in a global network, the Argo program will supply real-time ocean data for immediate use in research and operational forecasting of marine and climate conditions worldwide. Argo, observing the oceans in real time. Okay, so that was a video with the, um, before the entire Argo I, um, idea was realized. At the time, the idea was to have at least 3,000 floats that were operating in the oceans. What you're looking at now is a map generated a few days ago showing how many floats are currently active in the world's oceans, so in June 2020. And you can see there's 3,892 operational Argo floats that are measuring pretty much every part of our world's oceans. These uh, dots are also colored by the country that deployed them. So you can see that the green dots from the United States are a significant portion of the fleet, but that many other countries are involved. And I'd like to point out that the Canadian contribution in red is 87 floats in both the Northeast Pacific, the North Atlantic, and the Arctic. And Canada has been an important contributor to the Argo program from the inception in the 1990s and continues to be an active leader in this program. So the take home message is that this is a international effort. From the video, you probably got an idea about how an Argo float works, but I wanted to just underline how it can move from the surface to depth and back again. And it's sort of a clever way. So it changes its density in the water. And how it does that, the density is a function of its mass and its volume. And since it can't change its mass, but it can change its volume through what is referred to as this external bladder. And so an internal reservoir of oil or fluid will be pumped into the external bladder, which will expand, changing the float's volume and it'll contract and pump the fluid back inside the float and that will cause it to change its density again to sink. So at the surface, it will, it will um, shrink the bladder and sink to depth and then it'll increase the bladder and rise up again. How much an Argo float costs? Well, approximately 25,000 US dollars. But 
what's a good way to justify this kind of cost is that each float, once it's deployed, can collect a profile every 10 days for as many as six years, on average four to six years. So if you determine how much does uh, a, a single profile cost from an Argo float, you can estimate it as approximately 150 US dollars per profile. And that'll become important in a minute. So if you remember those numbers. The other important aspect about the operation of a float, which was mentioned in the video, is that the float spends most of its time at the ocean's depth at 1,000 meters. It drifts there for about nine days. And then when it's time to do a profile, it'll change its density and sink down to 2,000 meters where it will then become buoyant and it will take temperature and salinity measurements all the way to the surface. It spends uh, a short time at the surface, just enough time to transmit the data and then back down again for another cycle. So those 3,800 floats that we saw on the map are all going up and down on this 10 day cycle and sending their data in. So I'll go back to Tessa. All right. So you were forewarned, <laughs> but we do have this question for you. How much more expensive do you think it is to collect a CTD profile from a research vessel that's on the ocean compared to an Argo float that's operating autonomously? <laughs> Looks like a bunch of you have the hang of how to use Mentimeter now, so that's great. Yes, okay. Tessa, I think most people get the idea, and a hundred times is about approximately how much it, more expensive it costs to do one profile. You know, a ship would obviously make multiple profiles during a cruise, but each of those profiles would likely cost as much as $15,000 if you were to budget it out properly. And so the Argo program costs, say for example, 50 million, just as a put a number out there to keep that fleet going at 4,000 floats. You would have expect it to be a hundred times higher to do that much coverage with a ship. And so on the order of $5 billion, which is obviously not likely to ever happen. Now I'll go back to my two more tidbits about the core Argo program before we switch subjects here. An, uh, a very important part of Argo is when it reaches the surface, it sends the data via satellite to databases around the world. That typically happens within 12 hours, and so Argo data will transmit It'll reach a regional data center as shown on this graph, which will then um, either immediately feed to the global telecommunication system, which is the system set up for weather forecasting, for example. And that GTS feed will then assimilate this Argo data within 12 hours and can be used for uh, immediate forecasting and various other um, real-time needs. In addition, the data flows to two global data centers, and from there it becomes available to anybody who wants to look at it, including scientific users, other operational centers, data experts. And those people can then um, look at the data, make changes associated with quality control, and this delayed mode then will result in a high quality data set within 24 hours to a few weeks. At, at which point we have a high quality data set from all the floats in the ocean that anybody can use. So what has it been used for? Real quickly before we move on, I just want to point out a couple of high profile uses of Argo floats. This is a graph showing the change in ocean temperature. Uh, it's the global average ocean temperature measured by all the Argo floats. And so it's not from one particular location. And it's also a graph that's showing the depths of the ocean from the surface to 2,000 meters over time from 2004 to 2020. 
and it's colored by the temperature anomaly, so the difference from average. And so there's periods of time in the early 2000s when the surface ocean was cooler than the average data set. But in the last decade, and especially since 2014, the ocean has been behaving much warmer than average. And so although you can see some of this from a satellite at the surface, Argo allows you to see what the rest of the ocean is doing. A second important application is for modeling what's happening in the, and forecasting what's likely to happen in the future. One uh, you might be familiar with is forecasting whether we'll see a formation of a La Nina or an El Nino. And so Argo data contributes to this too. So Argo that you're not familiar with and these types of floats shown here has also evolved in its complexity in a variety of different ways since the inception of the program. One is to extend floats deeper than 2000 meters. The ocean can be as deep as, um, many parts of the ocean can be as deep as 4,000 to 6,000 meters. And so floats that can extend to those depths is one evolution of the technology. Just being able to um, sustain those pressures. And the second is to add sensors in addition to temperature, salinity and depth to um, add variables that allow us to track other changes in the ocean. And this is what we call BGC or biogeochemical Argo floats. So I'm moving to the second part of my talk where I want to first introduce marine biogeochemistry so that I can then tell you about BGC floats. And uh, if you take an introductory class in marine biogeochemistry, you're likely in an oceanography program and you are discussing how inorganic elements like carbon and nitrogen and the molecules they form like carbon dioxide move around the earth and what happens to them from physical and biological and chemical processes and therefore biogeochemistry. Uh, you're looking at a typical figure of the carbon cycle in the ocean where it exists in the atmosphere is CO2 it can be absorbed by the ocean uh, in a physical process or it can be taken up by photosynthetic organisms and in those ways it moves around the ocean pools and our understanding of this is critical to many aspects of climate change and the fate of carbon in the atmosphere. So one of the um, mechanisms I just mentioned was marine primary production. And here is an example of where satellite imagery is absolutely incredible. This is a composite satellite image of um, chlorophyll, either land, veg land vegetation or the microscopic protists that live in the oceans and also photosynthesize. And uh, high red color means there's high concentrations of these plants and uh, the, the blue or purple colors mean low concentration. So the first thing you can see is that the distribution of marine photosynthetic protists or phytoplankton is, is uh, variable and it really depends on a range of nutrient supply, ocean currents, light availability, and many other factors. And that really is one of the primary components of studying marine biogeochemistry is understanding these. And I'll show you, I'll run this video a little bit so you can see over time how much change happens, not just in the distribution, but even in the same places. So there's high photosynthetic, um, there's high rates of prime production happening in the northern parts of the Pacific there, particularly in the spring and summer. You can see that coastal regions especially regions where high nutrient input is occurring, uh, having what we call blooms of phytoplankton. And this phytoplankton is altering the chemical properties of the ocean. And these are the things that we want to measure. I'll stop it here where you can see, for example, the, the eastern boundary currents of Africa where there's high phytoplankton biomass all along the coast. So a little bit more about this. And if you were at the webinar two weeks ago, you would have heard the presenter ask you to take two breaths, the second breath being 
uh, oxygen produced from the ocean. And this is what we're talking about, is terrestrial versus ocean productivity, and that phytoplankton contribute approximately 50% of the total oxygen in the atmosphere, and therefore they also have a strong influence on carbon dioxide. Now, why is that? I like to think of it in this sort of simple way. I realize that this looks like a chemical reaction, and in a way it is. It's a biogeochemical reaction where inorganic elements like carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus are converted to organic matter through primary production. So sunlight provides the energy, and plants make organic matter, and they also release oxygen. And then animals and bacteria that consume organic matter, such as ourselves, we also consume oxygen to make that reaction happen, and we release CO2, and bacteria in the oceans release CO2, nitrogen, and phosphorus. More so, this is relatively quantitative, and so that we know approximately how much proportion of each of these is converted from one to the other. And what's Important about this in the context of Argo and BGC Argo is that we have sensors that can measure nitrogen, organic matter, oxygen, and even CO2. And so by quantifying these various things in the ocean through uh, something like an Argo float, we can learn a lot about the details of how oceans are changing that are otherwise very difficult to sense or to um, measure from a ship in much the same way that temperature and salinity were hard before we had Argo. Finally, the last aspect of this is part of the ocean biogeochemical cycle that we're very interested in is called the biological pump. So phytoplankton, which we just talked about, absorb CO2 through photosynthesis and they're either eaten or they sink to the deep ocean. And the material that's eaten often sinks to the deep ocean as well. And in the deep ocean, it's remineralized by aerobic respiration back to inorganic carbon. And through this process then, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is transported to the deep ocean where it can be removed for many thousands of years. Or if it's buried in the sediments, it can be removed for much longer than that. So the ocean biological pump has an influence on atmospheric carbon dioxide and thus ties directly to our interest in climate change and where the fate of anthropogenic carbon dioxide is going. So I alluded to this, but th this is then the point of a BGC Argo float is to quantify these uh, biogeochemical properties in the ocean and sensors can be strapped to this is a NKE, Biogeochemical Argo Float. It's a float that was built in France and is part of the European Argo program with the sensors all attached. And these are the six variables that are measured. And these parameters, oxygen, nitrate, pH, are all reflective of the nutrients and that equation that I demonstrated that between primary production and aerobic respiration. Chlorophyll A measures the actual phytoplankton biomass. Suspended particles is a, essentially the uh, cloudiness of the water associated with dust or other particles. And downwelling irradiance measures light. And how deep does photosynthetic active radiation or PAR, that's the energy that drives photosynthesis. How deep does it go in the ocean? And so all of these provide a very comprehensive understanding of this process. And then in a real world example, such as the west coast of North America, in our upwelling zone, because of currents and because the direction of the wind, especially during the upwelling season where it blows from the north to the south, it leads to this process of bringing nutrients up from the deep ocean, which stimulates phytoplankton to bloom, as we saw in the satellite image of the Earth, where there's high concentrations of phytoplankton along the coast. And this then can drift out to sea where that phytoplankton sinks back down and releases the nutrients in the deep ocean and consumes oxygen. So because we, that's how we, um, this is the type of process that BGC Argo floats can help quantify. So this leads to the various topics that can be addressed with this program 
understanding phytoplankton community distributions, ocean acidification, and how much uh, carbon dioxide is in the ocean, the uh, biological carbon pump, which I explained, as well as better understanding the uh, economic and the marine resources that are associated with the food web, understanding where carbon is going, understanding what we call are being able to sample emergent phenomena like the things that we are not expecting to happen because of our we don't understand everything about the ocean and so something like the north pacific marine heat wave that many might be familiar with was able to be captured by the argo floats even though we weren't expecting it so i want to now turn to some practical aspects such as how can you or anybody explore this Argo data set and I've chosen three tools to just mention and I'll take some time to go through this with you and so uh, the, there's many uh, other uh, visualization options for Argo or for accessing Argo data I've just chosen these three and I'm going to switch out of my browser and um, I'll let Tessa take over while I bring up the some of these uh, tools. Yes, so we're also going to have, just so you know, a presentation docket of things that we've mentioned, resources that we've uh, brought up today, and we'll send that a few weeks after the webinar and also when the webinar is, is posted on YouTube. So don't worry about trying to get all of this information down right now. We'll send it to you later. Um, so Joe, we can still just see your PowerPoint screen, so you might have to stop screen sharing and restarting. But uh, what we're going to do is look at one of these maps, and Joe's going to pull up uh, the instrument profile um, for one of these floats that's in the ocean now. And so we're wondering if you have any particular region or oceans that you'd like to look at a float from. If you have a region that you'd like to look at, um, just throw it in the chat. And if we have time, we'll go uh, and click on a few floats around there. Thanks, Tessa. So this is, if everybody can see, this is uh, the Argo Viz um, um, website. And what you're seeing here is a real time map of where all of the Argo floats are that have surfaced in the last three days. So this isn't showing the entire fleet because they, all these floats are on a 10 day cycle and some of them haven't surfaced in the last three days. But what we see here then is the core Argo, which measures temperature and salinity as the yellow floats. The green floats are the biogeochemical floats and the, the black floats are the deep floats that I mentioned. So if we were to just click on one, for example, this green float near Hawaii, it brings up a box where we can learn more about this float. If we click on its platform page, we immediately get information about this float. We can see who deployed this float, who, who built and deployed it. In this case, Steve Reiser and Ken Johnson from the United States. And then we can see that it's a biogeochemical float that has oxygen, nitrate, chlorophyll A, pH, as well as temperature and salinity. And in fact, this map here will show you, uh, you can sort of make out the Hawaii Island and the float has been circling around there during its time. And 157 profiles and it's been out there then for a couple of years. Um, if we want to look at the data, this other link here allows you to bring up the most recent profile. So I just went through this with you in an abstract way, but here's some real data. So for example, the temperature um, is much warmer at the surface than it is at 1500 meters. And that is obviously because it's in the tropics and it's warm at the surface, but in the deep ocean, we know it gets very cold. We can see very high oxygen at the surface and very low at depth. That's exactly the process of the biological pump, which also results in, for example, nitrate being very low at the surface and high at depth. So with a couple of clicks of the mouse, you can learn about many parts of the ocean. I don't know, if, Tessa, if anybody has volunteered any spots. Yes, we have a couple of requests from the audience. One is just south of Greenland, the place where there's a blue hole. And the other one was somewhere in the Arctic. 
Another person is wondering, um, gave specific coordinates where Hurricane Gonzalo is. I'm not sure if you know where that is, um, Joe. But uh, no, with the Greenland, south of Greenland. Well, so, so there's a few that have surfaced in the Arctic. There's one BGC float, uh, in, well, at least in the North Atlantic. And then the I, I will quickly mention about the Arctic floats. So obviously, one of the aspects of the Arctic that can be challenging is the formation of ice and if the Argo float can't make contact with the satellite because there's ice above it then it will stay below the ice and continue to do its profiling using a, an algorithm that prevents it from rising all the way to the surface and so we have to wait until the ice is free or the Argo float floats away from the ice and then we will receive all of the data. But the most northern floats that we're seeing here, there's a couple near the top. Um, I should move this up and we can look at some of them. But here's a BGC float in the high latitude region. We look at the profile page. Query the database and here we go. And so we see that for example, is clearly in the Arctic because the temperature, although very warm at the surface right now, um, at depth it's below zero degrees Celsius. That's what we would expect for very cold seawater. We also see that there's a, um, a dramatic decrease in salinity rate right at the surface, so some freshwater input there, and then a high, higher salt, and so we see a couple of different water masses from this float. Okay, unless there's another one that we should get to in the interest of time, I might switch to another example of how to visualize Argo data. Uh, here's the Ocean Navigator. Those of you in Canada might be familiar with this, uh, but this is a way to um, look at data from a variety of platforms and assimilate it and then display it. And so instead of seeing well, uh, a bunch of <coughs> floats, or profiles, we're seeing kind of the map of the, uh, of the current conditions. And this is showing temperature in the oceans at the surface, but because of the floats are part of this data set, we could look at, for example, temperatures at a thousand meters and the um, program will visualize this for us. And we can see it's much colder water, but there is still um, changes in temperature at a thousand meters. Sorry, every time I touch my mouse, it has to render it again. But for example, you can see in the Mediterranean that it's warmer at a thousand meters than it is in the Atlantic. There are a number of other ones. Here's one more. This is a, a newer tool from the European Argo program where it allows you to conduct fleet monitoring and you can choose um, to select these in many different ways. You know, let's just look at, our, at the Canada contribution. So if I just select Canada, we see all the floats that have been put out by primarily the Department of Fisheries and Oceans program. And you can select on one. And maybe you want to know where it's been. You can show the trajectory. And it'll show you where that float has been in the lifetime. And it's clearly um, a wanderer. It's obviously moved all around the North Pacific. So I think I'll switch back to my presentation because we're running out of time. How's that? Perfect. There's uh, uh, education and outreach opportunities through the Argo program. This is uh, from the, the uh, French website. Um, but this Adopt-A-Float idea is um, around many countries and the idea with Adopt-A-Float is that a classroom or a group of people can follow a float, adopt a float if you will, and, and keep track of it and it's an excellent way to engage people in the data and have their own float that they can follow and learn about the oceans that way. Now I want to turn a little bit to what Canada is doing, what Ocean Networks Canada is helping with and this is, again, I've shown the float contributions from Canada. And this is just the biogeochemical Argo float. So Canada has deployed eight. You can see them in red. 
again, the U.S. has deployed more. And in this case, there's 186. But Canada has plans to expand this. And those plans are underway now. This isn't a complete list of all the people and groups and organizations that are involved in BGC Argo, but it's some of them. And, um, and I think there'll be many more. But you can see there's a range of, from universities to uh, government agencies to um, companies. And instead of me telling you all about this, and I would direct you to this website where you can learn about who are the leaders in Canada and who are um, moving this initiative forward at this website here, which will also be provided later. And you can look at the projects that are underway and the people involved and other information. So the Canadian BGC Argo initiative webpage is a good source of information. And, and ONC was recently awarded funding from the Canadian Foundation of Innovation to deploy BGC Argo floats in the Northeast Pacific. This is a, you'll recognize now, is a, um, it is a, a screenshot from the program we were just on. So this is showing that there is really at the moment only five BGC Argo floats in this vast region of the North Pacific. And what ONC and in partnership with Department of Fisheries and Oceans and the University of Victoria, as well as UBC and, and um, RBR, our plan is to deploy four to six BGC Argo floats, which from this map would significantly add to the number that are out there. And we're also exploring possibilities of uh, deploying deep Argo floats. And the idea will be to would be to put throw these um, deploy these off of a ship between Vancouver Island and Station P, which is out in the middle of the Northeast Pacific, and we plan to start doing this as soon as possible. And so between now and 2022, we expect these floats to be operational. So. With that, I hope it wasn't too much of a whirlwind, but that you learned something about Argo floats and about the biogeochemical aspects of it. And I'm happy to take questions and thank you for participating. Great. So we're just gonna wrap up here before we move into our question and answer session. You can connect with Ocean Networks Canada on our website. We also have a wonderful data portal with lots of things available for you to check out and you can um, join via that link. We have a YouTube, a Twitter and Instagram and a Facebook presence. And you can also reach out to us directly by um, email. So thank you once again for joining us today. Ocean Networks Canada is funded by the Canada Foundation for Innovation, the Government of Canada, Natural Resources Canada, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, Canary, the Government of British Columbia, University of Victoria, and many others who contribute to make this project and many other projects that we're working on possible. So we're really grateful to them. So at this point, we're going to move over into our Q&A and Louisa is going to start sharing this on Mentimeter. And um, one interesting thing about this format on Mentimeter is that you'll be able to upvote questions that you're most interested in. So those will rise to the top. Um, as well, Louisa just posted in the chat a, a survey that we're sending out. If you have to leave early, we ask that you please um, fill out this survey, let us know how we did today and help us improve um, our future sessions. So the first question for today is, in the profiles, why is the sampling rate higher, closer to the surface than in deeper waters? Well, thanks for that question. I'm impressed that you noticed that. Um, as you might imagine, phytoplankton are really only growing and living in the top part of the ocean where the sunlight is. And in fact, because of stratification, that, air, that region is only about 100 meters. And so there's a lot of changes from the surface to 100 meters and then from 100 meters to 200 or 300 meters. And so um, what you want to do is capture that the resolution of those changes as best as possible. But as it gets deeper, those changes occur much more slowly. And so to optimize the battery life of the Argo floats, you'd sample a little slower as the float is rising 
when you don't need to capture the resolution, but as you get closer to the surface, you want to increase your sampling rate to see those changes. Great question and great answer. Are there any Argo floats used in large lakes to look at biological blooms? Um, there very well could be. I'm not aware of any and they wouldn't show up on those visualizations because they probably wouldn't be considered part of the core Argo program. But I, I would say that the floats that we saw, um, they conform to very specific requirements so that we know that, so that the data quality can be tracked. But lots of people buy and build and deploy Argo floats for their own reasons. And so there's lots of, there will likely be lots of biogeochemical Argo floats that are only sampling in the top, say, 200 meters of the ocean. And th that data wouldn't go into the global Argo operational fleet database, but it would be useful for, for various scientific reasons. So I doubt there's anything stopping someone from putting Argo floats in the Great Lakes um, in, in theory, but I don't know of any. Interesting question. I'm also curious about that. Do Argo floats get eaten by marine animals? Well, uh, an Argo float is about five feet tall and weighs 20, 30, 40 pounds sort of thing. So a big marine animal could tackle it probably. Um, we don't really know the fate of Argo floats that disappear from the fleet, right? They would, um, if they were eaten or damaged, they would sink to the bottom of the ocean. Um, so when a float disappears, we're not really sure what happens. And if they're being attacked by giant sharks, then, or giant squid, then we wouldn't know that but they do disappear. <laughs> an ocean mystery, very interesting. Um, another question, how tall and heavy is an Argo float? You kind of just addressed this. Are they all similar in size or does that depend on the usage? Good question. Um, so some of the tallest floats are about the, the size of a person, you know, five, six feet tall. Um, they are heavy in the sense that you, probably best if two people pick them up to deploy them, but they're not so heavy that they're unmanageable. Um, there's lots of manufacturers and companies around the world now that are building Argo floats. So the answer depends on what type of float and many countries have invested in their own float designs and shapes. And um, so, so there's more and more different kinds. Um, and it does depend on the usage. So floats that are gonna go deeper than 2,000 meters need to have um, different ways to, su to survive those pressure changes and so they have different design. Great. How many BCG Argo floats are being deployed in the Northeast Pacific between 2020 and 2022? So at Ocean Networks Canada we're planning to deploy approximately six. The program is still developing. We haven't acquired any floats yet. Um, and then in addition to what Ocean Networks Canada is doing, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and the University of Victoria are also deploying BGC Argo floats. And those um, are, are already being deployed. Some of them will only have a few sensors on them, such as dissolved oxygen, and others will have up to the six BGC sensors that I mentioned. So Minimum of six and maximum of maybe double that or more, six to 15. It'll be really interesting to follow that program as it develops. Just before I get to this question, I have another question from the chat. Can you age date water at depth in the deep currents with C14? Um, great question. Um, so not with an Argo float, but you can, um, from the CTD rosette and part much of the work in the WOS program and since has been to do um, a variety of um, often very clever measurements to understand how old the water is at depth. And um, there, there's a variety of ways to use radioactive carbon. One of them is to look at the signal from the period of time in the 1940s and 50s when 
there was a lot of radiation released from the testing of bombs and that some of that radioactive carbon was absorbed in the oceans and sank to depth and so we know precisely how old that water is because we know when those bombs were most active in the 1950s. So the answer is not just C14 but um, multiple different ways of using geochemistry to age waters and we know quite well the age of the deep waters in the North Pacific because of that and they're old. So the, some of the water in the North Pacific hasn't been at the surface in thousands of years. Great. Thank you. So, thank you for your question, Tom. How does this great body of information from Argo floats impact the decisions uh, made by policymakers or decision makers? Uh, I think in many, many ways. The best example, though, that, well, not the best, but one good example is that Argo float data is one of the only ocean observatory platforms that is used in the intergovernmental panel on climate change reports. So the IPCC tries to take data from science programs all around the world to um, release these reports on the state of climate change. IPCC report number five is out and report six will be out in another maybe two years and Argo data um, is prominent in many aspects of that report. So very influential. Wow, I didn't know that. That's really interesting. I'll have to go back through that report. <laughs> what are some of the technical and practical challenges of managing a fleet of Argo floats? There's a, it's, I hope you got the sense of how much work must underlie what I showed today. And so there's some, um, you know, at least 20 countries that are active have active Argo programs that have a lot of people working for them, data management, quality control, um, keeping track of all of those parts of the Argo program require um, all sorts of and present all sorts of challenges. Practically for managing the fleet is understanding um, I think to answer this question succinctly it is um, understanding how long a float is going to last. If it only lasts for three years for some reason, then you need to replace it if you want to keep the level of floats at the operational level of approximately 4,000. So really estimating how many floats are going to be required every year to sustain that 4,000 float fleet. And that's not done by one group and so being able to coordinate across all the countries um, is very important and so there's an international Argo steering committee that does a lot of that work. Great thank you for that answer. I'm just noticing that we're at noon now and a couple of people might have to go. If you have to go um, feel free to leave and um, thank you so much for your participation today. We'll as I mentioned send a follow-up with a docket of information that we covered today and if you'd like to continue on, we do have a few more questions left. Joe, did you want to answer a couple more before we end for today? Sure, happy to. All right. And just one more plug for our survey in the chat. If you um, have the time to fill out just a couple of minutes of uh, responses there, that would be really helpful for us and help us understand how to improve in the future. What is the geographical range of a single Argo float? How far can it go? Well, I mentioned that Argo floats spend most of their time at parked at 1,000 meters, and then every 10 days they do a profile and then they go back to 1,000 meters. So it really depends on the ocean currents at 1,000 meters as to where the Argo float goes. It's not in control of, um, it can't propel itself in any way. So it's at the mercy of the currents. And so in some parts of the ocean, it sort of stays where it is in the grand scheme of things and goes around and around in circles and sometimes it gets swept up in a current and moves around and so the idea of the fleet being large enough that if one Argo float leaves an area because of um, being moved away by the current it's a, there's a good chance or likelihood that another Argo float will move in and so that's how you keep the um, broad resolution 
by floats moving around and you can't really control where they go, but another one is likely to take its place. Great question. I was curious about that too. <laughs> Don't inactive Argo floats pollute the bottom of the ocean? So um, this is a very common question about Argo floats and the answer is yes, they do. Um, I anticipate a question like this and so I have something I want to show if people still have time. Um, I'm going to share my screen because it's easier if I show the data. Um, can you see that, Tessa? Yep, it's come up perfectly. So because uh, pollution from Argo floats comes up, people have, um, and very recently, the, there's a report here, the link is on the, um, the Scripps Institute of Oceanography Argo page. You can look at this paper that was, this white paper that was recently done. And what, the, what they did was they looked at what an Argo float consists of and the materials that would be considered pollutants. And so copper, zinc, plastic, lithium from the batteries, lead, some anti-fouling um, chemical, which has tin in it and aluminum. So really we're talking mostly about metals and a little bit about, of uh, plastic in each float. And so you can calculate how many floats, so all of the floats, nearly all of the floats that are put out, we don't get them back. Sometimes we get them back, but it's usually just um, a happenstance it, and it, we don't actively try to collect them. And I can talk about that in a second. But if you calculate how much of this material is in each float and how many floats are lost each year, you can calculate the flux. So what happens is the float sinks to the deeper part of the ocean at its end of life, and then it um, breaks apart and begins to dissolve. And there, therefore, there's a flux of this material into the ocean water. That's what we call that. You, so you can calculate that flux, and then you can compare it to the natural fluxes of these materials in the ocean. And when you do that, you see that really it's um, absolutely insignificant compared to the total fluxes. So for example, um, with respect to plastic, humans are also responsible for pollution of plastic from everything that's not an Argo float. And if you look at how much of that plastic comes from Argo, it, um, a single year of the human pollution of plastic to the ocean is equivalent to 4.4 million years it would, it would take for Argo to contribute as much as a single year. And for many of the metals, it's even bigger. So that one year of the natural flux of lead, so nothing to do with human pollution, but just the lead from the uh, terrestrial environment to the oceans would be equivalent to 83 million years of Argo operations. And so by doing this type of analysis, we, we acknowledge that these floats are staying in the ocean and therefore could be considered pollution, but it's very minor. The other aspect of that is that um, to go and collect these floats, you'd need a ship and you'd be driving around looking for a tiny little um, float in a great big ocean and that would take time, days or longer and every day of ship time costing $25,000 to $50,000 per day um, makes it um, economically doesn't make sense and the amount of fuel you would use doing that would add a much would add a large carbon footprint for collecting those floats. So I don't know if there's a follow-up question to that, but that's the answer. Great, thank you for walking us through that. I hope that answers the question. We still have 30 people hanging out with us in the room today, so I think we can keep going with just the rest of these questions. Are there any toolboxes for QA or QC, so quality assurance or quality control of the Argo data, preferably in MATLAB? Um, as you can imagine, that this, there's a lot of people working on QA, QC, and various other aspects of the data, and most of the toolboxes, as it were, um, are available on a dedicated GitHub site. And um, 
the resources are vast. So the answer is yes, and they're freely available. Great, thank you. So GitHub. Can, okay, we answered this question already. Thanks, Tom. How good is the pH sampling on Argo floats? Does it degrade over the life of the float? This is a Q, a QC question, and um, it opens up a whole series of issues and um, and is, is really the challenge for BGC Argo floats up until recently. And so each sensor has its own uh, issues with, with sensor drift or sensor fouling. And as these get optimized, then we can be more confident in the data. So the answer to the question is that it's, um, it's certainly good to start with. And it, as long as the uh, sensor is handled appropriately, and when you put the Argo float in the water, you can um, take samples because you're there on the ship in order to make sure the sensor is still in calibration. And then over time, it may drift, although the type of pH sensor that's used is, um, is less prone to drifting than other types of uh, older pH sensors. And so first of all, the drift is low compared to others. And second of all, it can be um, corrected for because since the Argo float spends most of its time in the deep ocean where um, parameters such as pH change very, very slowly, then from the first profile to subsequent profiles, you can assume that the water that the Argo float is in for you know periods of months at a time isn't changing. And so if your pH is changing, when the sensor's there, then you know that that's probably sample drift and you can correct for it. And so there's an example like that for all six BGC floats, uh, or sorry, variables. And because that the quality control is getting better, that's part of the reason why those variables were chosen in the first place. Great, great questions. I'm really loving the engagement today. What will the new ONZ Argo floats measure? And is there a possibility of equipping them with more sensors? So the six variables are kind of the chosen variables by the international Argo community. And so we could measure up to all six that I discussed in my talk, um, but for um, it's, it's, it's also the most expensive option. And um, so some people, including ONC, or some organizations, including ONC, might choose to deploy floats with not all six. And um, right now, we are settled on at least four. That's oxygen, pH, chlorophyll, and turbidity. Um, so the other two, downwelling, irradiance, and nitrate, we would like to add, but they add a quite a significant cost to the float. Now, outside of that core Argo program, um, there are people putting all kinds of other sensors on Argo floats. And so there is a possibility of equipping them with cameras, with turbulent sensors, um, and many other things. But that's much more of a, um, a research project and not um, a kind of a contribution to the operational Argo program. Great, and last question for the Mentimeter today, and then just two more from the chat and we're done. How much does a BCG float cost? Well, I mentioned that a, a core Argo float is about 25,000, and then each sensor costs more. Um, and so that's, and some of, some of those sensors cost as much as a float. So the answer is anywhere between 80,000 US dollars and 140,000 US dollars. So. They're very expensive. And, and we have to, um, over time, those costs might come down, but um, that's the similar rationalization about how much we need this information versus how much it costs, and then do our best to get as many floats out there as we can. Mm -hmm. Do they have cameras on them? So I've seen our, our, an Argo float in France that has a um, camera to measure zooplankton, yes. Wow, that's very cool. Okay, last two questions from Samaran and Tom. 
uh, from Samaran, he says, um, or they say, is it possible to detect the geothermal vents from the Argo floats? Um, in theory, it is. The Argo floats stay at 2,000 meters, so you most likely wouldn't see any chemi chemical indicators from vents on the seafloor. But as the deep Argo floats become more sophisticated, then you will be able to detect temperature changes for sure because those floats are getting to the rate right to the bottom. So some floats will go right to one meter above the bottom mm -hmm. of the ocean. And some of those deep floats are gonna start having other sensors on them, such as oxygen. But you would be able to detect these geothermal vents through temperature changes from deep floats in theory. Very cool. Last question. Um, are there more Argos in the El Nino predictive area for weather forecasting? I think there's a, um, a, a few places where the international community is um, you know, interested in knowing more. The Southern Ocean in general is an important area, especially for BGC floats. Um, and then in the, the El Nino, so the equatorial Pacific, um, there's not just floats there, but there's moorings. Uh, there's a mooring array that it contributes significantly to knowing the ocean conditions in the upper part of the water column. So Argo floats are hard, as we discussed, they're hard to keep in one place. So there are plenty of floats there um, that come and go and they supplement what is the uh, essentially called the towel array of moored instruments dedicated to El Nino modeling. Great. Well, thank you to everyone who's managed to stick with us until the very end. It's t about 12.15 now, so thank you so much for all of your great questions and participation. We really hope to see you at future ONC webinars or to connect with us on social media and to have a conversation that way. It would be great to hear your perspectives. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day or evening. Thank you.